All right, what's up, Civil War vampires? This is Stephen and Ben from Phantology with a review of Fever Dream by George R. R. Martin. And we have a special guest. We are once again collaborating. This time we have Zach from Middle Fantasy. Hey, everyone. It's me. I guess I came in on my steamboat today. I don't know how I got through California, but <laughs> we'll make it work. <laughs> yeah, appropriately dressed. Uh, Fever Dream is a story about steamboats, if, if you don't know. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's a book. I got my George R. R. Martin hat on, and uh, yeah, I'm pretty much good to go with this. I'm excited to talk about this book. So, yeah, Zach, exactly. tell, uh, tell tell listeners what you do, how they can interact with you, and, and why they should maybe. <laughs> oh yeah, no, totally. So I'm Zach. I run the YouTube channel Middle Fantasy. It's more of a booktube or fantasy tube, or more I guess pop culture because sometimes I'll talk about random things. But most importantly, I talk about books such as the Stormlight Archive, the Kring Killer Chronicle, Mistborn. That's a new video that's coming up. I, I talk about a lot of books and kind of deep dives. But more importantly, I like talking about reviews and talk about things that people don't necessarily read or they forget that it exists, such as this book, <laughs> Fever Dream, which I found at a Goodwill. And I was like, wait, there's a vampire book by George R. R. Martin? Yeah, I got to <laughs> read this. <laughs> Yeah, That's we've awesome. never heard of any of those series. So, uh, <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Glad, glad to hear that someone's reviewing that. <laughs> yeah, these little indie novels. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so you found Fear Dream at a, at a Goodwill. Uh, how long ago yeah. was that? Was this a, a book that you read kind of like back in the day or recently? Uh, this would have had to have been, I, I go to Goodwill all the time because I like getting weird movies and just finding weird stuff. This is my hobby because I live in the middle of nowhere. Instead of going to the Walmart, like most people, I go to the Goodwill with my friend. This had to have been four or five years ago. This is, yeah, yeah. I was still working at uh, Disney at the time. I remember reading it on the Mark Twain. <laughs> Oh, what an experience. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes I'll do weird stuff like that. It was just getting into the mood and reading this book and being, huh, okay, vampires. So if <laughs> yeah. you haven't read Fever Dream, you're not familiar, the story as described by George R. R. Martin himself is Bram Stoker meets Mark Twain, and there are vampires on steamboats in the antebellum Mississippi River area. Starts in like 1857 and covers a little bit through the Civil War and afterwards, very much a, a time period piece. And for me, I, and we're going to start with a little bit of a non-spoiler here. So if you haven't read, feel free to listen for a few more minutes. But for me, this was really fun to kind of like revisit a period of history that I hadn't really thought about too much since my high school days. And it was very immersing. Like I felt like I, I feel like George R. R. Martin understands it very well. And, and I was convinced at least that I was living here in 1850s. Yeah, I could see that. I think, um, we, I th I'm sure we'll talk about it, but because of the time period, there was um, issues that were discussed in the books like slavery that I don't know if were handled super well. Um, and so it definitely like brought up some, some stuff that could be problematic for the book. Uh, but other than that, I think that the time period was cool. It was interesting because we all read fantasy here. And so most of the time when you're reading fantasy, you're not reading in world. You know what I mean? You're either mm -hmm. like on some mm -hmm. cosmic planet or uh, wherever. But I mean, I guess you have like Dresden files that uh, takes place in world. But this was kind of weird because it was in our world, but set in a time period that nobody alive has experienced. And so it kind of has this mix of being fantasy, but being real life as well. Yeah, no, most definitely, especially when it comes to this book. I think what sets it apart from other books, because we think of urban fantasy, we usually think it's set during our time period. So it, yeah, like, I yeah. guess Dresden Files is a good example of this, but also a bad one because the first book takes place in 99 and there's phone books and the internet and it becomes super outdated within a year. But because this is set in the past, it has like this timeless feel where it can have this urban fantasy feel to it, but it doesn't seem like it's automatically outdated with the internet and having pop culture references, which yeah, I really right. do enjoy. Yeah, I guess uh, Dresden Files plays it pretty safe with pop culture. He pretty much sticks to Star Wars and Lord of the Rings. But Yeah, and <laughs> Polka. Are... Yeah, Polka never dies. Yeah. 
Come on, he, he ventures into more. Isn't there a Frozen? There's some Frozen jokes later on. Oh, yeah. I guess so. Yeah. But, yeah. yeah. That, that's, that's never going to die either. So <laughs> You just got to so let this, it go. So this book, yeah. uh, Fever Dream, is about 40 years old now. Almost 40 years old. And I, I assume it's one of the earlier books that uh, Martin has written. Although, uh, to be honest, I have not read anything that he's written other than this and other than Song of Ice and Fire. Mm -hmm. So I think one thing we can talk about is the, like, what are the similarities here? How do, how do we uh, connect this book to what he did in A Song of Ice and Fire? And with the huge gap in between the time that he wrote this and, and A Song of Ice and Fire, I, I think... Uh, maybe that's not quite fair because there's some things in between that I haven't read yet, but we'll do our best to kind of speculate. I think Zach, you've read a few more than I have even. Yeah. I'm a huge George R. R. Martin fan. I've read um, night flyers, Armageddon rag and a bunch of his other ones. I think, Oh my gosh, it's been a while since I think it's wild cards, which is like a superhero thing that he kind of writes, but doesn't mm. really, it's like he edits it. it. It, I just don't, don't quote me on this. But this is a book that when I was rereading Fever Dream, I was looking at the similarities between this book and how you would take this kind of model, because I think this is a prototype for A Song of Ice and Fire in many ways. There's actually a part in this book where he, the, one of the characters, Abner Marshall, actually says fire and blood when he's talking about slavery. Yeah, I do. I remember that. Yeah. Uh-huh. It's like, oh, wait, he just literally just talked all about, like, this entire thing he's talking about is literally Daenerys' whole storyline in all of A Song of Ice and Fire with her you know house words fire and blood and obviously the food descriptions obviously he, he can't get yes. away from that <laughs> yes <laughs> that's this is interesting to listen to because this is actually my first george R. R. martin book that i read really i watched game of thrones but i haven't read um i mean i haven't read a song of ice and fire as Stephen would be apt to correct, uh -huh. correct me uh -huh. um i i should i've i've started the first book a few times but i haven't it's tough when I know the story, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I want to get around to it, but this is my first, yeah. So this is my first Martin book. Also, I think another thing that I'd probably bring into this as well, that I'd be, I'd hate to forget about this is that he's also taking things that are very much echoes of historical fiction in many ways. And this is a prime example. This is pretty much set in the backdrop of the civil war, whereas a song of ice and fire is pretty much the wars of the roses in many ways. Mm -hmm. and you, you can see the parallels between him pulling fantasy and history in many ways and seeing how they work and intertwine within this narrative, which I think is really cool because I like history a lot. Okay, so what are some of the, let's talk about this in our non-spoiler section and kind of, you know, make this a little juicier for those who haven't read Fever Dream yet. So what are some of the similarities that, uh, that you see, Zach? We'll start with you since I, it sounds like you already have some lined up. Well, like I said before, there's uh, the similarities with a lot of the speeches and kind of what George R. Martin is kind of saying here, especially with when it comes to similarities, there's like these gray level characters. They're not all bad. It's just within their nature in many ways, especially in the time that things are taking place. That's kind of this example that I see here as well as when it comes to it. I find that again, there's the food descriptions, which, you know, he, he can't get rid of, but I guess that's just George R. R. Martin <laughs> in his prime, except I, I get kind of annoyed. There's like this one who talks about super crispy chicken and I'm like, oh man, that'd be awful like burn it black I'm like oh <laughs> i hate it uh what's i saying oh yeah food food's bad but i think the other thing is kind of the message of this book kind of echoes the same as with the song of ice and fire and how it's very bittersweet there isn't necessarily like a traditional happiness to the story without spoiling anything it kind of has like that bittersweet somber tone to it as well as all the supernatural creatures aren't necessarily inherently evil in many ways. They're just mm, yeah. doing what they do within their nature, which we see time and time again within Song of Ice and Fire with the others, as well as kind of the other supernatural things. I could I can accidentally talk about Game of Thrones for too long, so stop me if I do. Uh, but <laughs> there, there's things that happen in that way. I think he, so once again, he gets really into the kind of moral ambiguity of a bunch of characters. He writes gray characters really well, which if you've seen Game of Thrones or, or read Song of Ice and Fire, you know. I think in this case, like he doesn't fully embrace it because, and, and it's hard to talk through this without doing spoilers, but like you say, Zach, like it's not a traditional happy ending, but there is like somewhat of a satisfying resolution, we'll mm -hmm. say. It's bittersweet. And, yeah, and I don't know if you would even see that much of it in 
and in Song of Ice and Fire. So gosh, it, it's really hard to do too much of this without, I and mean, we are talking about endings for both things. So uh, we can't get too much of that. But <laughs> we don't I'll even say, know the real ending to Song of Ice and Fire yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but, so there's moral ambiguity, but I don't think he's like fully embraced it. So I see a lot of the roots of the characters and the way he develops plots in Fever Dream, but I see him like really leaning into that more in A Song of Ice and Fire. And just like developing his skills and fleshing all of this stuff out more in the years since. So I have a question. I think uh, this is kind of coming from an outside ob- observation because, like I said, I haven't read uh, A Song of Ice and Fire. So we recently reviewed Elantris, which was Sanderson's first novel, mm-hmm. and and it was cool because like you could see him cutting his teeth on it. You know what I mean? Like it oh was, yeah, it had some. You know, it, it had all the good things that made make Sanderson Sanderson, but there's a lot of rough edges. Is that kind of like? maybe how this could but could compare it to a song of ice and fire it's like there's a lot of to, a lot there that's gonna happen again but like maybe it just begins to be more polished and and maybe more well thought out hmm. i think the best way to put it if in, in my own words without spoiling anything i guess because i mean you, you've seen game of thrones is that um all the actiony things the things that make this book very much super pace and especially a lot of the hard-hitting conversations get mm-hmm. so much better i think it's like this is the coal and after george R. R. martin has kind of stressed in the story for a lot and kind of took it because originally it was supposed to be a trilogy but then it became you know as yeah. many books as it right now we don't even know how many it might be <laughs> the split up into like 18 more books uh, oh, but gosh. <laughs> you see that it becomes condensed into like a diamond almost and you kind of can see the diamond in the rough mm. that makes sense and not too rough no, I, I enjoyed no. I enjoyed Fever Dream quite a bit. Yeah. Um, okay. So before we move into spoilers, let's like tell people why they should read this book, and then maybe why they might want to steer clear. Um, maybe some reasons why they might want to avoid it. Yeah, like Zach said, it's uh, fairly fast paced. I think it's an interesting look at the, the time period. Uh, I think it's a somewhat of a unique take on vampires. Not super unique, but there's some unique elements to it. Yeah. And I think there's two at least two really solid characters maybe three if we count sour billy um mm-hmm. but i'll say i'll say abner and joshua york are both really solid characters and and two that will probably stick with me for at least some time after reading the book so uh, i i don't think the plot was super amazing but it was fast-paced enough to be engaging all the way through and i i mostly just enjoyed kind of being immersed in historical fantasy yeah I agree with that. I think that uh, all the conversations around morality in the book and th- those were engaging for me. Um, and so I think that there's going to be scenes in the book that stick with me a lot. And so, and uh, yeah, I agree. I think the character work was really well done. Uh, plot, it's a book. It had, you know, like it's a, it's a fast paced book. Mm-hmm. So, but I, I wouldn't say you should read this book because of the hard hitting plot points, you know? Yeah, no, I have to agree with you. I think I start when this with like the cons of this i think the book is fun but you already know if you've read any vampire story doesn't matter if you read dracula down to i don't know twilight you already kind of yeah. already know the twists that are george R. R. martin's already setting up because it has yeah. to be like a set in like a, the vampire tropes that have to occur like i already knew the first one that i read it about like oh i wonder who the vampire is oh well, right, it's easy right. on the first page <laughs> But you, yeah. you see things like that. But for me, what I really find so fascinating about this book is I think you actually brought up a really good thing is it's like historical fantasy in a way where it isn't just sword and sorcery or even just urban fantasy of driving around and solving crime. I guess man, I keep, shouldn't be using the Dresden Files again for this, but <laughs> you, it's like a little different than what you're used to, especially saying it in this antebellum South where the main focus is on the river and on the steamboat where it's so different than what you traditionally read especially because you're so focused on this weird it's almost like a small kingdom like this microcosm on the fever dream by the end of it it feels like its own nation in many ways which mm. I, I really really like and it's one of these things that's so different i think george R. R. martin takes a concept like if i summarize this hey everyone why don't you read a book that has vampires on steamboats people would be like that is dumb yeah. But George R. R. Martin elevates in a way where it actually becomes scary when you actually think about it. And when the characters think about it, it's super spooky and perfect. Yeah. I, I, I agree with that. I also think that a lot of the trick with fantasy writing is to make just all the talking interesting, right? So like you see it like 
you, as an author, you have to figure out how to make these like long-winded conversations interesting to listen to. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times that's like characters walking on a path and maybe like, oh, they're now they're getting mugged or something. But here it's just interesting because the whole setting is interesting. And, and we have this like vivid vision of the fever dream as a ship. And so I think that that's like, he kind of went through the legwork at the very beginning of making this very interesting setting that he's then able to kind of rely on through the book so that when these when these characters are having these long conversations, it feels natural to be having them and it feels interesting. That's something Sanderson said that I think has stuck with me and sounds like maybe stuck with you as yeah. well, Ben, like the, the, the fact that these books really are just like a long series of conversations mm -hmm. and how do we make it interesting? And I think he was kind of talking about Mistborn in that context. And he said like, yeah, you know, the, there's probably some things I could have done to make that book more interesting. And yeah, like you say here, the interesting thing is really just the whole immersion into the, the vampire thing and and the fever dream like the ship becomes like fairly spooky like with with the vampires and we don't want to do spoilers too far but yeah. you know eventually it gets to the point where it's yeah, it's, it's a scary, scary place i don't want to be on the fever dream it, it also becomes a character as well within the story that's what i really like about it is you feel for this boat in many ways mm -hmm. even though it has yeah. no dialogue other than the ship went chugga 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 yeah. You, you express how much you love and kind of I guess what's the word I'm looking for here? It's like this gothic beauty in many ways, or I don't want to say dark carnival because it isn't like a Ray Bradbury type of story, but it has this Americana to it, kind of like the uh, what we consider like the cowboy in many ways on the horse. Like there's one of my favorite pictures is this most iconic one where it's this cowboy. He's in the foreground in the background. You see like a airplane. And it's mm -hmm. like the most American picture ever. But when you think of the South, you think of the steamboat in many ways and the things that can happen in that while well, my brain just had a fever dream. <laughs> <laughs> well, you talking about like the ship having personality. I don't know if you've ever seen Community. The first episode of Community, Jeff goes on this long like uh, monologue and he's like, we're humans. And the thing that makes us humans is if I pick up this pencil, I'll tell you his name is Billy and then break it, you feel for Billy. <laughs> and then yeah. it's like totally, you know, like totally fits with this book. Oh, you know? yeah. It spends a page talking about the creation of this boat in the novice and you you feel for the boat. Yeah, so, yeah. It, it, it's kind of great, especially like the way I think about this is the exact same way I think of like Mad Max Fury Road in those cars. They're almost like living creatures in many ways. And the, you know, even though their purpose is much like a chainsaw, they're just there to serve a function, get from point A to point B or chop wood. But what you do with that can be good or evil. They're like as neutral as neutral can get. It's what it's in the hands of the people using those devices. Yeah. So I think one reason, and I, I brought this point up with Steven on Discord, but the one reason you might want to stay away from this book, I think, is is the treatment of slavery. Um, mm -hmm. I didn't think it was handled particularly well. And it was, you know, without too many spoilers, like slaves were essentially food for vampires for much of the book, um, which is kind of off-putting, very off-putting, actually. I'll mm -hmm. say very off-putting. So if that sounds like triggering for you, just don't even bother because I, yeah. I don't know. That's my, that's my take on this. Um, so I don't know. And we don't have to spend too much time talking about that, but I figured that you should probably know that. Yeah, and we, yeah. you know, we definitely want to approach that sens sensitively, and we're, you know, just kind of three white guys talking about this, so, um, you know, we don't, we don't want to uh, uh, cross any lines we shouldn't or, tr or try to assume. But I mean, I will just like one pushback would be like it kind of makes sense in the time period. You know, the vampires are looking for easy prey, and unfortunately, like slaves are an easy way for them to do that. So. Uh, I think it does make sense, but yeah, I mean, obviously like the image is not, is not good. See, yeah. I think this does a, so this gonna sound really weird. This book does a much better job than the other vampire books in the civil war, which is Abraham Lincoln vampire slayer, where that's the whole point of the book. Whereas this is kind of, yes, the depiction of slavery is also from the perspective of the eighties. And we're looking at this also from a modern perspective, Right. And so we're like, yeah, it's, I, I guess it's, that. it's less I, the word I would use. I don't know. I shouldn't be using this word, but it isn't as pandering as, okay. If you ever watch the movie, Abraham Lincoln, vampire slayer, they, they use a lot of horrific things in that movie that is just downright offensive. Mm -hmm. Whereas this one is kind of, it's offensive, but it's kind of like you, it, it's kind of one of those things like you can't have a thing set in the civil war without having slaves, but 
it's also treated in a way where yes, it's bad and slavery is yeah. bad. Yeah, I and, and there's I some that. good discussions there, like this the slavery there, yeah. and the the abu abuse of power kind of aligns with what the bad vampire group is trying to do, and, and without doing spoilers. And on our good side, we have you know abolitionists and Abner later participates in the Underground Railroad. And so I, I, I mean, at least we're setting things up in the correct good and evil, right? It's directionally <laughs> yeah. correct, right? Well, yeah. yes, and it's also the people that you're rooting for are the people that you should be rooting for. And it's not like, it isn't like a Song of Ice and Fire where you start to side with the slaveholder a little bit right. with like a, like a Jamie Lannister situation. You, It's pretty much defined who's good and who's bad in many ways. This isn't like the, the lost cause argument in any ways, which I probably won't bring up, but it's like one of these things where it, it it's actually kind of an interesting, if we get into spoilers, I can actually kind of talk about this and how this entire book is just, um, I'm about to use some English stuff. It's like an allegory for the civil war in many ways without yeah. it being very well, much apparent. I think, I think we're pretty much ready to transition to spoilers. We've told you why you should read the book, great characters, told you why some things you shouldn't read the book plot's not as strong and maybe if you're gonna if it's if reading about rough depictions of slavery is gonna be a hard thing for you to do don't bother um i think that's i and now i think we're pretty much ready to get into spoilers we've kind of talked around it for a while now so. yeah all right so if you haven't read yet go read and it i think you want to if you don't want to read a 40 year george r, r. martin book you know but yeah, yeah. you okay. should read it though yeah spoilers spoilers are happening now Ooh. <laughs> okay, so Zach, let's kind of keep on going with the guy yeah. I'm interested in, in hearing the allegory. So the allegory that I'm seeing within this book is kind of, you have this, think of it as, okay, again, one, one thing is first is we're on the Mississippi, which is at this time in the 1800s is the lifeblood of all economics and commerce between the North and the South. And yeah. it's almost like this neutral ground in many ways. This is where even during the Civil War, once the pretty much... It's argued that once the Mississippi was taken over, this is where the Civil War pretty much ended because you needed railroads and those can be dismantled, but it takes a lot harder of a time to dismantle this giant body of water. I, I've grown up near the Rio Grande in New Mexico. It's intimidating, but kind of this macrochasm that we have here is each character that we see here is basically based off of the the feelings and the sentiment at the time. We look at, well, I'll look at Abner Mars first because he is like this working class guy who doesn't give a flying truck about anything but his boat. He is the <laughs> working class person that's kind of caught in the middle between these two people where you, you pretty much have the North and the South. You have Joshua York, who is kind of this, I would say Northern sentiment where he's kind of this person that's more of the progressive person. It's like, we don't, we, I have this special drink and we can, we don't have to do all this stuff. We can do without it, right? We can do without it. We don't have to mm. hunt anymore. We have a better thing. Whereas you have pretty much, um, oh my God, Julian, who is yeah. more of like the traditional antebellum superior. Yeah. Like he, he calls everyone cattle. He has this thing mm -hmm. about like pretty much, everyone beneath him is inferior in many ways and he uses everything to get more power even though he doesn't need to drink blood he still wants to crave this power to the point of where he's willing to steal and pretty much he he takes the boat and literally secedes <laughs> yeah. and hides up in his plantation and then you have other characters like i look at this book also as a story if i boil down every character this is just me and i have my notes over here is that <laughs> I'm an old person. I like notes is that it's, this is a story also about everyone has their motivations all about ambition, which is one key factor of the civil war. Everyone was ambitious about everything with expansion as well as kind of just uh, a lot of things when it comes to just moving westward, but also at the exact same time, building up everyone's kind of boiling point. And this is where literally like a boiler exploding on a steamboat, it takes place and, it just erupts into the way by the end of this book. It kind of feels like the ending of Reconstruction where everyone's just miserable. Everyone wants to die and everyone's old and weary and they don't care about anything but dying. Yeah. So I, mm. I like that because I think my, my major criticism around the slavery point is that it felt like it wasn't like, to me, there are two options. Either you mm. just don't address it, right? Like that's one option. Like it's set in the time period, but you don't really address it. Or two, you like, fully address it and you make it that a big part of the story. And I like that you're kind of pointing out that it's 
it's a much bigger part of the story than I originally gave it credit for. I mean, you kind of had to look for that, right? Like it yeah. wasn't kind of on the surface. You had to grasp, for, not grasp for straws, but you need to, you, need, you have to like think of this stuff in a way of like, for me, I loved looking at right. the Civil War. The Ken yeah. Burns Civil War is like the greatest film of all time, in my opinion. But uh, yeah. And yeah, there's really like only one character that you could even say is somewhat of a main character, mm -hmm. not a main character, a side character who who is a slave, right? So I see what you're saying, Ben, where it's not really a part yeah. of the plot hardly like at all. Like you could have taken slavery out of the book completely and like have changed like one thing. I, well, they would have had to change Julian's ability to convince, to like talk about vampires the, in the way they did. Cause he would always go back to, oh, but like you treat slaves like you treat slaves, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so they would have had to kind of change that part of the book, but like nothing else would have had to really change. And so that was kind of my criticism of it was, you know what I mean? Like it didn't need to be there. Um, and, yeah. and especially like when they killed, like there was two parts that really hit home to me that I didn't like about the book was I, I recognize why they were there, but when they, when they killed the slave girl at the very beginning, mm -hmm. right? Like mm -hmm. the 16 year old girl at the very beginning. And that's kind of setting up Julian as like this terrible person. And then obviously when they killed the baby. Oh yeah. yeah. Um, See, that was the hard part. That's the hardest yeah. part about this book is the first time reading that is shocking. It's shocking. Absolutely. And this is when I was like, cause you hear about George R. R. Martin and like, and watching Game of Thrones, you're like, okay, there's some shocking things in that show. Right. But th that's like one of those things where it's like, oh my gosh, like he just went there. You know what I mean? Like, um, yeah. and so, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll say kind of going back to how we were talking about the evolution of, of Martin a little bit. The shocking things are still there, but the twist that accompanies the shocking thing is not there as much in Fever Dream. Like the plot is fairly straightforward. There are no mm -hmm. huge twists that you see in Game of Thrones, Song of Ice and Fire plot as well. Yeah. yeah. Uh, actually, the, another thing that I would add to that, especially with the baby thing, I think that this is also something that I think that's also important is that that scene isn't just there for shock value. It actually carries weight throughout the rest of the narrative. They bring it up several, several times between Abner and Joshua in this way. And this is kind of the defining factor of why they have to kill Julian. Yeah, I, well, okay. So I agree with that. They, you know, it's not just kind of shoved off to the side, but do you think that the character would have been any less motivated had that not happened? I mean, Julian was still picking fights and, and you know, like uh, there was still going to be this feud between Julian and, and um joshua no matter what you know what yeah. I mean? like that was already going to happen but the, it made the conflict that, stronger well i think yeah. the difference though is that if you look at it the only reason why abner went at the end to the fever dream is because of his ambition he wants to get the fever dream back he doesn't care about anything he helps causes but every cause that he's doing especially the like the weird time skip period is to try to yeah. get back to the fever dream he's looking for it, it it's his pretty it's much his yeah, it's his white whale. He can't let go of it. And he gets more sad the second the eclipse is pretty much, you know, this glorious ship becomes yeah. kind of just plywood. And this is what nearly kills him. Is like he can't have that race that he's always wanted to do. Mm. And yeah, it's kind of like one of those, it's one of those like double-edged swords, especially when it comes to slavery. It's like, do you do it or do you not? If you set it in this time period, it's like damned if you do, damned if you don't, almost type of situation a little bit, which is yeah. hard. Yeah, I think I agree with that. It's it's hard to, and that's why it's like very, it's a decision to to set anything in this time period. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, like you could definitely see this book being canceled today, right? Like, uh, so it's kind of, it's kind of tough to recommend people to go read because, because of these things that happen, you know? Um, mm. Like, I'm not really sure who would I, I would like recommend to go read this book. You know what I mean? Like, certainly like I recommend like, my nieces and nephews to pick it up. I might recommend somebody that's really ingrained in fantasy and like just is looking for like another fantasy book to read. I'm like, oh, okay, like this is like an all right book. You know what I mean? And it's interesting because a lot of fantasy books have slavery as part of them, right? Yeah. Stormlight Archive, Song of Ice and Fire, uh, many others that I Mistborn. can't think of off the top of my head. Sure. Mistborn <laughs> yeah. as well. Uh, but when you say, okay, it's actually happening in America, in the civil war right. time in, in the 1850s and it's something that's happened to you know real people that we actually can point to in the past yeah. like that's where it becomes 
just, you know, harder to deal with. And honestly, mm -hmm. if I was writing a book, I, yeah, I probably would just be too afraid to even to try to approach it correctly. Yeah, yeah. It's one of those hard things. Like we, we still deal with it today, especially when it comes to, before we even started this recording, we we're talking about Disney and like Splash Mountain, which is deeply ingrained in like the song of the South and yeah. that type of whole thing. Like, what do you do in that situation? Obviously you change it for the best and figure out what's to come because you have to reevaluate a lot of things, especially when it comes to, you know, the current landscape of what we live in now was it's one of those hard things as well to talk about. It's like, it, it's again, it's like damned if you do damned if you don't, but it's trying to approach it in a way where it isn't just what's the best word to put this like a, that's like, not like, I don't want to say stereotyping, but it's almost like insulting to a whole group of people, which I think this book doesn't do, but it doesn't do a good job of saying why everything is bad it's just there yeah and it kind of bugged me when like when our main character that's supposed to be like the most traditionally good guy you know abner when he just like conveniently becomes involved in the underground railroad for a paragraph sure. you know what i mean it's like like to me it's a little i mean we talked about how it's not pandering but that was kind of pandering you know what i mean it was like yeah okay like yeah <laughs> you know it's yeah, like oh I mean, he's the... good and, and by the way let me remind you why he's good because he doesn't like slavery. Yeah. 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 yeah that's something that, that does occur. But and, he does but, have that relationship with his, I can't remember the guy's name, his cook, who's a slave and he respects yeah, him and he, he had freed him. So, you know, he's got some background. Mm -hmm. And I think also the biggest thing as well is like, if we're talking about language is that again, going back to kind of what I was talking about is that the two main characters don't throw racial slurs around compared to the other people. Oh, oh yeah. man. I know. <laughs> This, yeah, we, we don't have to this talk not about be allowed it. in high schools at all. <laughs> so, but yeah, I, yeah, it's like one of those things, especially when it comes to the story, which for me, I think the best parts about the story is kind of the riverboat life. I, I'm the person who likes the Mark Twain life on the Mississippi and all yeah. the stuff about like boat racing and going down to New Orleans and just having a fun old time. There's a lot of fun in this book, and then you get to like the horrific stuff. And it shows like how George R. R. Martin, as much as he's a fantasy writer, he is more of a horror writer, especially you see this in the Song of Ice and Fire a lot with the um, the others, or you want to call them the White Walkers or any of the mm -hmm. other stuff. And in this book, this is just him being a horror writer at times, as yeah. much as it's fantasy. It's, I, I don't want to say it's grim dark because it ain't. It's I, I would say it's historical fantasy. Yeah, But dark, dark historical fantasy. It's dark, yeah. Yeah. It definitely does not have rosy, you know, rosy picture. Um, so, yeah. Um, so, but yeah, let's talk about the characters. So, so we kind of yeah. danced around him a bit. So Abner Marsh, we said in our pre-recording that he's basically current George R. R. Martin, uh, you know, <laughs> larger guy, loves food, uh, wears the same hat that Zach is wearing right yeah. now. And, and George R. R. Martin wrote this book because of some time that he spent I don't remember what city it was in, but you know, around the the riverboat uh, area around the Mississippi, and yeah, where uh, they built riverboats, if I'm not mistaken, yeah, that's back, where we kind of got the, the idea. Yeah. So honestly, like, is Abner Marsh George? I'm not well, saying he's not. Well, I hypothetically, that, yeah. Oh, go on. I was gonna say George R. R. Martin just had this book as a vision board in his house, and he be slowly became it. I I think. You or know? maybe it's his autobiography. Maybe he was a riverboat captain and this is his, he, he's a vampire. We've never really seen him. I guess we have seen him during the day, but maybe <laughs> it's one of those things. Maybe he is Abner Marsh. It's just he has to keep changing his name sometimes and gets <laughs> bored. That's funny, look, yeah. Look, if I was an author, I think it would be fun to kind of write myself in to the story <laughs> to some degree. So I, I, would, I would fully support a theory that this is in fact George. <laughs> Oh yeah, no, totally. This is because he didn't. We didn't technically see him die, did we? We didn't see Abner Marsh <laughs> technically die. We just saw his spooky grave, which anything could be in there: rocks, pieces of the <laughs> fever dream. It's just him. <laughs> We're going. So Abner going Marsh down. cares. Abner Marsh cares zero about anything other than the fever dream and racing the fever dream and the Mississippi and steamboats, and that makes him somewhat of a simple character, but it also makes him. I thought a pretty deep character as well, because we got into his mind quite a bit and sure, like he only really cares about one thing, but uh, that doesn't mean he's not human. I thought he was a, he was a pretty human relatable guy. 
I don't know what you guys do. You like Abner? Um, I think that he like he's very one dimensional. He's likable, and he's likable in the fact that you can understand his quirks. You know what I mean? It's like he's had he's a guy that's had a bunch of setbacks in life, but he's still kind of persevered. And and he is like, what do they call it? Like he practices like brutal honesty. There's like another name for it that's like popular right now. But he he just like tells you what he thinks. You know what I mean? And he's he has got no filter. Right, no filter. He's a man of his word. You know what I mean? Like he's not gonna like backstab you. Um, mm-hmm. When he's caught going through Joshua's room, he just owns up to it you know what i mean instead of waiting for um yeah yeah you know yeah. so he's he's just a straight shooter you know yeah i think for me one of the reasons why i think abner marsh is a really good character is that fundamentally he's already broken and we're kind of seeing him trying to fix his life like he knows yeah. he has a problem but also at the exact same time one of my favorite things and this is just me if you want to write a book and take notes on this you want to impress me or make me happy is that i love characters that they have a fundamental like they're good at one particular thing and that one good particular thing is what there might be a situation where they need to have that and the characters like i am the only one for the job like i love the whole river uh, boat thing they have with like the eli reynolds and the fever mm-hmm. dream where they're like racing and he's like using his racing prowess to like okay if we get caught we're all dead everyone and everyone's like what the hell are you talking about like i love that type of stuff which we see here and he he, i guess it's like he he's pretty much as ambitious as the two vampires but he's a different type of ambition it isn't blood that he wants but it's steam and metal in many ways that's what he craves yeah and a race and acolytes i could see that i i think i'll kind of piggyback off what you said i like when one a character has like a defining thing about them but I, I like when that defining thing kind of affects every other part of his personality like i think in that time period a steamboat man needed to be a straight shooter you know what i mean like you need to be able to depend on their word because you're going to get on their boat and basically be at their mercy yeah um and so i like how that like one defining thing kind of uh like allowed martin to write like kind of fill in the gaps of his of his other personality traits it, it, And it's also something to bring up as well when it comes to when people think of, oh, it's like a steamboat cap and that doesn't mean anything. Now that doesn't really necessarily mean anything. Like it's a joke about the whole, you know, Suez Canal thing. But you have to think (laughs) back in the back in the day, these people were the equivalent of like astronauts in the 1960s. These people were like the rock stars and the superheroes because these are the people that drove these big ships. Again, they had huge clubs Mm. they had these prestige it's hard to explain what it it was like to possibly be like a steamboat captain if you want a really good depiction of this mark twain actually wrote a book all about this who he was a steamboat captain up until about the civil war actually i think right when this book ends is when that book was published this is just my weird facts that i know but even his name mark twain comes from a steamboat thing when it comes to i think 12 feet underwater is just what it is but that's interesting. Yeah, because his real name is Samuel hmm. Leghorn Clements. Right. Longhorn. But there we go. That's my dollar store trivia for today. Uh, but it's one of these things that you look at it, you have to like think about it. These people were the biggest, coolest people. Like they even make a big deal about this. Like they have special people that have to pilot on the river. Like these people get paid a lot of money. Like they're, they're the people that fly the airplanes now, but the airplanes are on water and wood and everyone's kind of just gets drunk on these boats. <laughs> yeah. Well, so one thing that I thought was interesting was he wasn't as much of a captain as he was uh, like financier or like a, like a builder. Like he, he owned a fleet, right. And then he mm-hmm. would hire out the fleet to different captains to actually like captain the ship. So um, that's why the was story starts. He's kind of at like rock bottom and he's just lost a bunch right. of this. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Cause like the river froze over and like ruined a bunch of the ships or whatever um yeah so i don't know i okay so i think we've talked about um abner marsh quite a bit right like he's he was a good character to kind of follow throughout the book because his motivations were always pretty simple just trying to figure out be on the right side of right and Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um and also do right by his steamboat that he you know had a windfall basically had through and every now and then he cared about people on the steamboat not always but sometimes oh yeah (laughs) When they died horrifically, he he cared about that a little bit. <laughs> it's also like it breaks my heart at the end when you find out really what happened to the fever dream and just how he describes 
how oh, yeah. destroy like destroyed beauty in many ways it's like that's not mm-hmm. a fitting in for a ship and you get like a little a, a little tear comes down your eye and it turns yeah. into steam and flies away <laughs> also they they renamed it ozymandias right yeah i kept getting watchmen vibes and they kept thinking of jeremy irons and the hbo uh, watchmen show for some reason I haven't, I haven't seen watchmen i was i was getting just vibes from breaking bad because mm. isn't that the name that's the name of the second to last episode or whoa, the, whoa, the whoa. highest okay. rated episode this is this is like i have three more episodes of breaking bad ironically right now i'm just so. telling you the name of the episode well you also told me it was a highly rated one so well the the series is highly acclaimed of course there's going to be highly <laughs> rated episodes i'm just saying and i've also watched about half of the hbo's watchmen so i'm like just what till you're about to get double the, spoiled yeah, double oh spoiled no right now. <laughs> yeah, hurry up. You gotta watch them both at the exact same time. Yeah. <laughs> one in each eye. <laughs> I will right, say let's, I, let's go okay. to Joshua. Should we talk about Joshua? Yeah, yeah, let's talk about Joshua. Okay, so yeah, like you were saying earlier, Zach, he's somewhat of a tropey vampire at the beginning. You meet him right away. You know the stories about vampires. There's this really refined, beautiful looking guy whose grip is super strong. Like, I wonder who the vampire is. Yeah, it's obviously this guy. It takes Abner forever to realize this, but of course he doesn't have, you know, the, the summary of the book. Well, the, the back cover of the book saying it's about vampires like we do going into yeah. it. He just anyway. thinks he's some weirdo that has a lot of money. He's like Tommy was so. Yeah. <laughs> and I so want to, further I want than to that, be... further than that, like, how'd you, how'd you like Joshua? I thought his backstory was interesting. I thought the whole blood potion alchemy thing was kind of a nice twist. And, and what you were talking about earlier, Zach, how he kind of stood for the, uh, like, symbolically, he stood for the abolitionist North. That, that was interesting mm-hmm. as well. Yeah, it's, it's one of these things, especially when it comes to Joshua. He, see, when it comes to him, a lot of the stuff that I like, but his personality is dirt at times. Like, he's, like, not interesting, but all the events that he does yeah. and what he perpetuates is interesting. Like, he's a person that I really don't care about because he's... He's he's not good at two shoes, but he's kind of like this. Per- he's the Edward Cullen, like he's just mopey and doesn't really do anything. He's just there a little bit, yeah. He, he needs a vampire. He goes out in the sun, gets horribly burnt up like a crispy chicken. Uh, <laughs> but that's that's about it. That's because he's kind of he's he's the goody two shoes a little bit, which is yeah hard. Even when you get his backstory, his backstory is the most interesting things about him because that's when he's like really the traditional vampire. He talks about it, mm-hmm. but otherwise. It's hard to talk about him because I can't really define what makes him interesting other than he perpetuates the story and gets the fever dream off the ground. I think one plot element that wasn't really needed that was just kind of thrown in there was the whole like chosen one prophecy oh, around yeah. him. I don't know if that did a whole lot for the story. Like he's going to become king of the vampires and and the other vampires had kind of like latched on to this. And by the end, it works out because it is somewhat of a happy ending, even though, you know, uh, it's a little what's the word foreboding or just, you know, it's a little sour with, with Abner dying and visiting his grave, but he does eventually become the King and teaches them how to not drink blood. And I guess like kind of saves the vampires. Yeah. Well, I think the even dumber thing is like the ending is like, Oh, by the way, I'm having a child Bye. what? Yeah. What, what is this plot line? That is like a high buy type of plot. Line? It's like, do I want to have a sequel in this book or do I not want to have a sequel? <laughs> um maybe he I didn't know. know yeah maybe I he's that, maybe he's writing it now that's why yeah it's, maybe, so long for it's actually winter. it's secretly if you read all of a song of ice and fire backwards it's just the sequel to <laughs> fever dream so i will say uh having a redemption arc is always like well first of all we know george r, r. martin is like really good at redemption arcs but it's always like a tough thing to do right with anything because either like you, it's obvious that you're trying to have a redemption arc and it just fell flat or you did it really well and you have to devote a lot of the book to it and so it was interesting that you had joshua who didn't need a redemption arc right like it was kind of this one-dimensional character that's just kind of progressing the plot but then he went back into his backstory and you really like don't like him when you're reading about his backstory you know he's like mm-hmm. murdering a bunch of innocent people and not a great guy i mean he's trying to be good but still and so i don't know like he, I guess that he kind of made the redemption arc because he ended up figuring the potion out. Um, 
and that kind of redeemed him a little bit. I don't know, but it was like, I was fine with this character until like, oh, now I, I like don't like this person very much. Yeah. So I don't know. I'm, I'm getting like Winter Soldier vibes a little bit. Just finished that series the other day. and mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, it's kind of hard because when it comes to Joshua at one point, he is an interesting character in the sense of, again, he propels the plot, but everything they talks about and obviously off the bat he's the world's worst vampire oh by the way i have to be inside all day but i also have to do random things and just do it as i say don't do as i do like yeah. oh he's kind of if, if you're not if you if you know anything about vampires once he gets to the 21st century he's screwed yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, well i don't know how often is that how often have i left my house in the past year oh well if he can make it to COVID, he's good yeah. But, <laughs> yeah. Well, until he has to make new potions and stuff, he has to go outside. During... I guess he could order everything off Amazon. Yeah, yeah Amazon will bring him his potions. <laughs> oh, man. Maybe, maybe, yeah, maybe it just became easier for him. Like, I don't me. know. Maybe, it, have you got, maybe, I don't know. There's a deep cut, but True Blood is like an HBO show. Maybe you just like the original founder of that's, True Blood. Anyway. That's what I was thinking about because isn't that Louisiana <laughs> Vampires too? Yeah. Yeah. And they yeah. have this potion that they can drink that. Well, it's like mimics real blood. Anyway, so don't go watch that show. It's not great, but um, (laughs) so, okay. um, I had another thought about him. Oh, are we, one thing that was kind of tough for me was believing that there was only like 12 vampires left in the whole world. Cause like at the end it, it was like, our species almost died out. Was that like real? Like, are these the only two covens of vampires in the whole world? Hmm. Like that, that seemed kind of unlikely. Well, I think that's kind of like one of those things where it's like, we're the only two vampires left, but in the sequel, oh my God, they're on an island in Hawaii or something. Yeah. Um, like the, you, when, when people say we're the last, you always assume, well, the world's really big. Yeah. And there, there could be different vampires. I don't know in asia russia right. maybe in places that just don't have the sun like antarctica or the north pole or the south pole yeah Al- they, alaska is full of vampires and it's funny because he kind of paid they pay lip you service. to be there so yeah yeah you can't pay lift service by saying like oh all cultures like have a name for us and we have like these legends that like you know are mm-hmm. everywhere and then what they all congregated in europe and america that's kind of interesting Unless it's supposed to be like the westward expansion type of feeling. It's almost like the manifest destiny. Like we're just going to keep going westward, which is really silly because if you're having a good thing in the middle of Yugoslavia or like in Eastern Europe, you're, you're good. You don't have to do anything. Yep. So I don't know. That was that. I don't know. It felt like you're trying to raise the stakes a little bit too high, too quickly. I'm good. Just believing that there's other vampires elsewhere that, don't need to be involved with our characters at all i guess i just assumed that was the case well it it said something at the end that was like our species would have died off or something or you know Mm. so i don't know okay let's talk about the other coven of vampires led by damon julian and i think the more interesting character was sally sour sour billy tipton julian for me was just like this force of evil we got it right away when he killed uh, the young slave girl and then when he killed the baby later on and he basically was just insane and had a crazy bloodlust. He didn't even need to drink the blood. He just did it because he liked killing. Like this dude is just straight evil, which is not that interesting, right? Like he's just this force of evil. But Billy, I thought was more interesting. Yeah, I, I like Billy a lot. I think I'll probably talk about Billy a little bit because I like how you already know kind of where his story is going to go. Like he's not going to really become like a vampire, mm-hmm. but he's doing all these things and he, he thinks he's going to become a vampire to the very end where he kind of gets his just desserts a little bit where he gets, I love, it's kind of like a comedy shot, like in any movie where he's like this big imposing person, but the second he's like old, it just gets shot. <laughs> and falls down and you have like this horrible pov chapter of him trying to get up and his legs don't work and he's like using the knife like it's like child's play too okay that was straight song of ice and fire stuff there that like the the bad character finally getting his just desserts to some degree and it's in this kind of gruesome way and you get their pov a little bit that yeah that's been used we've seen yeah And it's also kind of like that those descriptions that he uses, especially like it isn't really a fight scene, but he describes like his legs don't work. And he has to like use the knife and he has to get once they get to the banisters, 
I, you know, I'll be able to lift myself up. And it's like this crazy, almost Machiavellian ending almost where it's, it's almost Scheidefreude in a way of like, you, you just like to this guy suffering because he's just been a horrible, awful person in many ways. And you're just, you're just happy when he just bites it at the end. Well, my, so my thing, how the heck does this person that's been blasted with a shotgun at least two, maybe three times and then fall? How does he manage to be the one that sticks the vampire in the eye with a blade? Like, he throws it. Oh, does he throw I, it? I think he throws oh, it. because we, we see that he's he was like a knife thrower when he took out. Blessed. I think that's what was happening because they have the setup of that where he takes out the, the engineer that way because he, he does the exact same thing. It's like uh, he, oh, yeah, he, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. he plays dirty. That's his whole thing. Like He isn't going to fight fair. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was that was a. I guess that makes sense. I was I was imagining that he like just like stood up really fast and jumped on him or something. I don't know. That makes Maybe. more sense though that he was able to, to throw the knife. Yeah, you know he got those vampire powers for a second yeah. and died. <laughs> oh man, that yeah, could have been that? an interesting twist. So I mean, we knew all along that he wasn't really going to become a vampire. Like you're just getting played, dude. Julian's not going to make you into a vampire. It's not possible. As a reader, we kind of all know that. Would have been an interesting twist if, like, in fact, he was becoming a vampire. I don't yeah. know how well it would have gone over, but, like, I, I could see a world where that happens. Like, they switch places. It's, like, blood for blood in many ways. <laughs> yeah, or maybe, I don't know. Well, I guess it would be, like, if you're doing the George R. R. Martin thing, it's, like, death can pay for life. In many ways, like, you have, like, the Mary Maz door thing. Of uh-huh. You have to s- sacrifice one thing to gain more power. In many ways, yeah. yeah. So, so kind of the one that was kind of like a, t- a traditional twist was finding out that that Joshua. The reason why Joshua was able to uh, win the battle with Julian that one time yeah. was because he he hadn't had his drink, and that his drink was the thing that kind of made him less powerful in this soul gaze moment to steal another <laughs> thing from Dresden, uh-huh. right? Like, um, yeah. so that was kind of cool, a, a cool twist. Not that it had any actual impact on the book but um i enjoyed that well it had a little bit i mean it was the reason why they won yeah did so that the ending was kind of weird for me i just it's it's paced weird i think that's the problem it's like the the worst part about this book is the ending confrontation because it's it's as if like george r martin was writing it but he was paid by the the word to the Mm. point of where he like oh i gotta i gotta finish this really quickly okay they, they die at the end okay yeah, I could see that. Like it was, yeah. I mean, and the and plus the pacing of we're gearing up for this epic battle. Thirteen years later, you know what I mean? Like that. That was weird pacing. Yeah. What do you guys think about the big time skip? Yeah, I wasn't. I I just don't think it needed to happen. So I didn't hate it. The problem though is when it comes down to it, is that. It can be jarring, especially when you have like this, you know, action beat, action beat, action beat, and then it just becomes it just like a dead stop for a little bit. It's like you have to pick up the pieces and go, which that's fine. But usually, you need to have that in a way where it feels earned, rather than like, oh, they got away, and then you maybe do a couple more chapters of trying to find stuff, and you have like that giving up point. Otherwise, it just doesn't feel right, and the kind of happens in this a little bit. Yeah, I think that's one thing that Martin likes is some of these like expositionary, expository, whatever the word is there. He does that every now and then. Like if you've read his, uh, what's the Fire and Blood, right? Oh, the, yeah. Yeah. It's basically just like a long history of the Targaryens. And Which it's I pretty, like. <laughs> yeah, I, I enjoyed it. But it's pretty much that all the way through. Just like, here's what happened. And somehow it's still super captivating. He does a really good job of that. Yeah, he does a really good job of this, especially when it comes to his world building and filling in the blanks in this way. And we see this with, I love all the scenes they have. We're going back to Damon Julian and Sarah Billy Tipton as all their scenes they have in New Orleans and they're like being assholes to these people that deserve it when they, you know, oh, this is the pool that I go to. This is where I killed your boss and things like that. That stuff's fascinating, especially the part where they're literally eating, um, oh my gosh, I want to say John Benet Ramsey, but that's completely wrong. Oh God, Benet's the 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 treat. Wow, I just went from John Benet Ramsey to a treat. Yeah, I'm going to hell for this. Uh, 
Sorry, Zach, but, I can't I can't help you here. I uh, know it's oh my god, it, it's fine. It's the powdered sugar things, and they're literally almost drinking mint juleps and they're having a fun time. I don't know. I, I also know what you're talking about. I don't know how as a former employee of Disney you can't come up with a name here. What it's the but uh, Beignet? Beignet, there we go. I guess yeah. because I, I kept saying John Benet Ramsey. <laughs> <laughs> oh, for all you true crime people out there, I'm going <laughs> to hell for that one. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, there, there's things like that. But it, again, when you get to the things about like the slave auction and the old plantation, the old plantation stuff works. But when you get to all the like the slave stuff, this is where it does get really bad in the book. And I wish they kind of glossed over that a little bit. But the stuff with like the, the dilapidated plantation and kind of how Julian swindled an entire family out of their plantation is fascinating to me. But everything else is just kind of bad in the villain's perspective in a way yeah that was i wish that they would have spent more time i don't know that was like that like history of julian like swindling that family out was like i think actually where like the most character development for julian like came from you know what i mean where it was like oh my gosh like this person it's like his super speed or his agility at night isn't what makes him dangerous it's this like you know like yeah, it makes you believe nectar, that like, he is actually capable of a villain right. who should be feared rather right. than just this like dark lord of evil guy. Yeah. He doesn't monologue, which I like a little bit. Like he kinda he he, he has like semi logs, but he doesn't monologue. Yeah. He's more just like, I'm going to stand on the merits of like, here, I'm going to make this one argument. You can either accept it or not, but I'm still going to like take power and, you know, move on. Yeah, it because was, he's, oh, yeah. Go, I'm sorry. I was going to say, it's interesting when they were kind of monologuing at the end where uh, Joshua was saying, oh, he's like just this older than old creature that all he does is hunt, but like that doesn't even do it for him anymore. You know what I mean? Like he's just going through the motions at this point. Like yeah. that was interesting too. Like he's literally like a silver tongued devil in mm. many ways, but that's what gets him killed in the end because he tries to talk his way out of the situation and then gets his head blown off, which is great. Yeah. Okay. Any other any other plot beats or themes that we need to talk about? Otherwise, I think we should go to our closing segment, which is the worst of the best. And uh, if there's any other things, maybe you can bring them up then. Awesome. Okay. I'm, let's still, do it. I'm trying to think of one that I that we haven't talked about. So just let me. <laughs> okay, we'll we'll give you a little bit of extra time. So yeah. worst of the best, we're going to talk about uh, the the things that we liked but maybe there's like one thing that kind of you know put a sour taste in our mouth a little bit so zach do you want to start or would you like me to go uh, i can go first i think a lot of it is the food arrangement that they have if i'm gonna okay. take the, i'm taking the, the easy way out because everything yeah. they think is great except for the amount of time they talk about peas and squash and things just oozing in butter i'm like i'm gonna get heartburn and he talks about i need this all this stuff for <laughs> For my strength, I'm gonna have four brandies, and the way that Abner Marsh eats like a pie, uh -huh. it gives me heartburn reading it every time. He just I, he just tucks he just tucks back a copious amount of food. No, not no even like a copious amount of food. Like they literally talk about him eating up entire pie by himself. <laughs> I'm like, is this just George R. R. Martin just being himself? <laughs> hopefully, hopefully not. Hopefully that's. A fantasy element hopefully people don't do that in real life <laughs> i've i mean the, there are pie eating competitions yeah mm -hmm. <laughs> we're all praying for for martin's health though you know you no gotta, that's what makes him stronger <laughs> everyone yeah. thinks that make, he's a food vampire he needs food <laughs> to survive <laughs> okay I, I have one i'll go so okay i really liked the idea of the boat race right and you see it a little bit at the beginning and it was leading up to that. I thought there was going to be a race with the eclipse, I guess, is my thing. I thought it was really sad when the eclipse just got turned into scrap pretty much by the end. And the fever dream never really had its big moment. Uh, it, I, and I get it in the story. It kind of works and it, and it makes sense. And it, and it gives you this real somber tone to the whole thing as the Mississippi River itself is dying. It makes sense thematically. I was just bummed as a reader. Like I wanted to see the big boat race. I like races. I thought it would have been really fun to see. So great because of the themes it presented, but the worst because it was just like tough to see, tough, tough to not see the race. Yeah. yeah. 
I get to do that. Um, okay, for me, worst of the best. I really enjoyed that we um, got exposed to the like person that was in Billy's place before Billy. Like I forget what even what his name was. Um, he was kind of like I think he was a former slave, or maybe maybe he wasn't, but he was you know kind of this had been like this um, help to uh, to Julian the whole time, and then Julian just kind of like left him. And so I, I enjoyed that because we, we saw what Billy would have become had he like lived. But I wish that instead of just killing him outright, that that he would have like been part of Julian's downfall. Like that would have been cool had they like said, hey, do you want revenge or something? You know what I mean? Like mm, we're kind of okay. incorporated him into the story a little bit more. Like I thought it was interesting that he was there, but like if you're going to put somebody in like that, make it like count more than just for this random mm like random scene that we don't really need you know what i mean like you go tied it in a bit more in general minor characters not a big yeah, thing in very this book because there's there's what is it valerie and her thing is she burns to death yeah that's yeah. it that's the she, that's her character that's all she's the hot vampire that dies well she she unsuccessfully tries to seduce her main character on multiple occasions because apparently she's uh-huh. supposed to be very good about that who's obviously can't. the george r. r martin insert character so yes. yeah <laughs> yeah yeah that's even better now (laughs) nay yeah i can't can't do it my only love is me steamboat (laughs) oh man because yeah there's her and then there's the other one there's harry mike who dies and then there's the other guy who gets his neck snapped i I was just a spectacle guy jeffers i think his name is and then there's the other guy too there's the guy that is with is with Abner for a long time and then finally retires. Oh yeah. But we obviously we don't remember any of these guys' names, so Yeah, not yeah. very. It's kind of the thing, it's like you only have like these four characters because their names are very snappy and different. Though every time I kept hearing Abner Marsh Marsh, I'm like, oh is it like Mistborn? Mm. It's yeah. kept popping mm-hmm. up a little bit, but after a while I'm like, okay, this is ain't the same Marsh. <laughs> Obviously, it ain't the same it's Marsh. As... So you've obviously got your Mistborn video on your mind, which you said is coming up soon, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know, man. Marsh could be a world hopper. You never know. I would actually love like a a Cosmere steamboat. <laughs> well, there's, I mean, Wax and Wayne. It's kind of it's virgin really that. steam. Yeah, it, it could be there's kind of steampunky. Oh no! What would what would Abner Marsh's alimantic powers be if he was a uh... I don't know, man, sir. I've never. Mar- oh, I don't know, but he could be. He strikes me as somebody that could be a wax type person. Like yeah. a twin born, yeah. Yeah. I mean, we could just call him a pewter thug, basically. <laughs> yeah, he builds. He's, oh, he eats. No, he's no. Oh my God, he's like lift because he eats yeah. food. Yeah, that's how, he gets stormlight that, <laughs> that way. Stormlight your food. Yeah, that's nice. his investiture. Yeah, he doesn't. He actually doesn't need metal to be a, a pewter thug. Yeah, seriously, he gets his arm snapped and just like keeps on trucking. <laughs> All right, well, this has been fun. Thanks for joining, Zach. Uh, yeah, it's always wanna... a pleasure. Yeah, tell people one more time where they can find you. So, if you want to find me, you can find me on YouTube at Middle Fantasy. That's Middle Fantasy. If you want to follow me on Twitter, it's at Suda41. That's S U D A 41. I just chat about books, and bad movies that I watch, and that's about it. But those are the two places you'll find me most likely, or the bookstore. <laughs> Now that I can actually go to the bookstore. Yeah. And that's about what Phantology has to offer as well. If you want to see more of us, you can find us online at www.phantologybooks.com on Twitter at Phantology underscore books. And uh, yeah, we talk about books. We don't talk about bad movies as much, but you know, every now and then we venture into other things. <laughs> well, we have to, we did do one episode about the Artemis Fowl movie. On oh yeah. That was a fun oh, one. <laughs> that was like looking into oblivion. That, <laughs> that was tough. That was a tough watch. I never grew up with the Artemis Fowl, but I was in the generation that everyone loved it. I was the Series of Unfortunate Events kid. No. Oh, love. Yes, love Series of Unfortunate so, Events. Which uh, they, you know, they, there was a successful adapt, adaptation of that. I don't know yeah. why they couldn't have. Underappreciated. Underappreciated, by the way. Yeah. It's, it's is one it of those underappreciated? Things. Yeah, so it's... everyone forgot about it. You can't even, it's not even on the main page of Netflix if you want to look for it. Oh. Huh. You actually actively have to know that it exists to find it. What an outrage. 
Yeah. Well, maybe if all three of us go watch it right now, it'll be number nine on trending or something. Who knows? Maybe I've tried. My my former co hosted a whole big series of Fortune Events podcast, and they oh. had a hard time getting people to watch that show. <laughs> okay, underappreciated. Yeah. All right. Thanks for tuning in. Check Thank out you. Zach's Mistborn video coming soon. And yeah. Till next time. Yeah. Final words. Final vampire. Time. I got nothing. We're done here. Oh uh, yeah. It's uh, let's let's steam out of here. Full steam ahead. <laughs> Full steam ahead. There it is. Yeah. That's that's what we needed. All right. See you later. Bye. Right. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Phantology. If you'd like to let us know your opinions on all things sci-fi and fantasy, join our Discord. Invites are in the episode descriptions below. If you'd like to support the show, like these fine folks here, you can do that at patreon.com slash phantology underscore books. Patrons get early access to new episodes, exclusive postings, and exclusive Discord benefits. But of course, just listening and watching and sharing with your friends and family is support enough. Journey before destination all.